Well, part two is the crucified Savior is risen. That's the theme of the Bible, starting at John 20, and it's covered through Acts 1. And Jesus rose, the creator ignored and rejected by most, showed himself, but he only showed himself to those who had believing eyes. He only showed himself to those who had loving hands. They're the only ones that got to touch him. It's interesting that Jesus wasn't seen or touched by anyone after the cross except those that loved him and those that believed in him. Those who would adore and reverence and obey him would see him and he stays with them for 40 days. He shows them his word. He teaches them his truth. He confirms what his plan is. In fact, he shows himself to 500 people, it says in 1 Corinthians 15. And then he commissions them and then he goes. And the crucified creator who became the risen savior went back to where he came from. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed and only potentate, as Paul calls him in 1 Timothy 6, ascends to heaven. And as he leaves, he showers down blessings on those he left to proclaim the good news. Which leads us to the third part of the Bible, the, the back part, is the angered judge is returning. That's the theme of the Bible from Acts 2 to Revelation 22. You can't read any gospel presentation anywhere in the New Testament without having in its direct proximity a warning. A warning. What's the warning? Well, probably the most profound summary of the gospel ever preached was preached by the man who embodied the message. In fact, go in Acts to chapter 17. I want to show you something interesting. Now, I could show you this until you all fell asleep and fell out the window, okay? Just like Paul used to, but I'm not gonna do that. But Paul embodied the gospel. He's the only one that Jesus took to post-cross seminary, and he took him to three years, and he explained to him the gospel so completely that nobody else wrote down the gospel like Paul did. Paul systematically wrote down the legal side, the, the jargon of how God accomplished redemption. The, the explanation of how a holy God can actually forgive sin, not forget it, but actually have it paid for for those who receive Christ. And, and that's, that was written down by Paul. So nobody understood the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection more completely than Paul did. And so what we have in chapter 17, starting in verse 24 of Acts, is one of the most amazing moments in history. The apostle Paul has been invited he didn't plan on this. He was just, actually, he was kind of in a layover. He had just left Thessalonica, that's 17.1 of the chapter, and he'd walked down to Athens recovering from all the injuries that, that he had gotten along the way in chapter 16 in Philippi. And he comes to Athens, and he's just resting there, but as he walks around, you know, eating and, and seeing the town, his heart is grieved. And so he just makes a little mention of Christ, which he's so brilliant and powerful in communication that the most educated people people of the world who lived in Athens, you know, all the people that are the fathers of philosophy and medicine, mathematics, and all those things you have to memorize in school, they live there. And they were all very, mm, you know, big heads. And they said, this is something new we've never heard. And they invite him in front of them, and they give him less than two minutes. Starting in verse 24, read it out loud. It takes one minute and 40 seconds to read. In less than 275 words, Paul explains the gospel. And you know what? Do you know how he explains it? The same way God does in the Bible, because I think he follows that. He says, there's a creator. Look at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, there's the creator. Verse 27, he's a savior, that you should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him. He's not far from each one of you. That's the arm's length. He isn't, he isn't you don't have to go on a trip. He, you can grope. You know what grope means? Reach out like this. It's kind of like you're in a cave or you're in your house at night and you're looking for the light switch. Jesus is within an arm's length as Savior. But he doesn't end there. Look, how, look at this. This is the missing link in the popular socialized gospel of our day. Verse 31, the judge. See, the creator, he introduces that, is the Savior that died. But if you won't listen to him and reach out for him, look at verse 31. He's the judge. He has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Remember Jesus said in John 5, the Father committed all judgment to me. And he says in John 5, 28, marvel not for the hour is coming into which all that are in the graves are gonna hear my voice and they're gonna come forth either to judgment and damnation or to righteousness and life. 
Jesus is the judge. And look what Paul says at the end of verse 31. He has given assurance to this all by raising him from the dead. So the creator that became the savior is risen and he has got his arms open. But if you don't respond to him, he's gonna be the judge. Now, all he says there is that he's gonna judge the world in righteousness. So let me ask you, as you look at this text, how did the apostles describe the proper response that humans should give to the ignored and rejected creator? who became the crucified and risen savior. I mean, here's Paul, he's got under two minutes, he's got the brilliant minds of his day, and in 275 words, what does he say to them? What does he tell them is, is the way to get out of your predicament that you've ignored and rejected your creator, and he has been crucified because of your sins, and he has risen, he's got his arms open to you. What response does he want? So that, that's why this is one of the most beautiful sermons in the Bible. Well, look what Paul says, it's in verse 30. Right at the end of verse 30, what does he say? He said, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. You know, there's an interesting movement nowadays that we're supposed to go in and help people. We don't wanna change their culture. The problem is their culture is sinful to the core like ours is, and everything in them needs to be changed, including their culture. Because their culture shapes them, and they need to be reshaped by Christ. And so their personal culture needs to change. You know what that culture change is called? Repenting. I'm gonna repent of anything in my life that God has said displeases him, dishonors him, grieves him, and he calls sin. And that's the only hope that anybody has. Look at the end of verse 30. He commands everyone to repent. There's only one acceptable response. 